Good afternoon and uh, welcome back. I hope uh, everyone enjoyed our plenary session this morning and the breakouts. Um, I sure did. I had the opportunity to go and listen to the farm food and fiber session and then the water session. A lot of great information there. If you have not had a chance to hear Bonnie Davenport's presentation or her polling data, you really should take a look at it. It's really pretty mind blowing and inspirational about uh, public opinion here in Minnesota. Um, before we get going with our panel, though, I do want to first recognize some legislators. I saw three legislators that have spent most of the day with us here today. If you're here, please stand to be recognized. Um, Representative Lugenius, Representative Acom, and Senator France. Yay! Now the dreaded part, if I've forgotten you, please stand. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, I did note a couple of former EQB members, um, Kate Knuth and uh, Kristen Weeks Duncanson, and then Metropolitan Council members that are here too. So please, uh, if you could just stand and, and thank you. This is my last reminder to you all to uh, submit any last minute questions and, and vote through Slido for the panel. Um, I also want to make sure we just take a quick moment to thank the chef and the kitchen staff. A wonderful lunch today. And thank you to uh, Minnesota State University Mankato for the use of your venue um, and, and all the behind the scenes support you have given us. So at this point, I would like to introduce uh, University President Richard Davenport. He is the 12th president of Minnesota State University Mankato and is in his 17th year as president. Under his leadership, the university has developed a climate action plan and worked to reduce their carbon footprint by over 4,200 metric tons per year. These efforts provided over $400,000 in energy savings. President Davenport also serves on the board of directors for Greater Mankato Growth and the Minnesota Center for Rural Policy and Development. Thank you for being here, President Davenport. Well, welcome everybody to uh, this wonderful event that we're uh, pleased to host here on campus. And uh, I hope that you did enjoy your morning sessions, the uh, uh, breakout sessions, plenary sessions, and so forth, all about important environmental issues. At Minnesota State University here in Mankato, which I'm sure many of you know about, we take very seriously our commitment to the environmental challenges that you're talking about today. And as a matter of fact, seven years ago, we made a commitment to reduce our carbon footprint. And after seven years, we've reduced our carbon fo footprint by almost 16%. Our goal is to reduce it to zero. So we have a challenge ahead of us. I also want to say our institution is known for being environmentally friendly. And our students are taught the importance of the climate and the climate change and the impact that it will have on their futures. So it's very important, and we're very pleased to be able to host the event here today. So um, I just want to mention that we do take pride in our campus, second largest university in Minnesota, uh, four different centers and campuses around the state. But I got to say, while we take pride in how beautiful our campus is, we take more pride in how clean it is. And we have a long way to go with that. So now, everyone, a short speech is always best. It's my distinguished pleasure to introduce Minnesota's 41st governor, Tim Walz. Tim was here when I came, and uh, his career has really been defined by one day, public service. From serving our country in the military, to serving our students in the classroom as a high school teacher, as a football coach, to serving our state in Congress, and now serving our state as governor and providing the leadership that is so true to him. Governor Walls, it's no question, is a great friend of the greater Mankato area and to our university. In addition to being a great friend, he is also 
I'm proud to say, an alum of this university. Having received his Master of Science degree in experiential education, which is ranked the number one program of its kind in the country. So with that, everyone please welcome Governor Tim Walz. Well, it's always nice to have a friend introduce you. Then, uh, I, some of you heard me say this before, but it's true that if you know the difference between a eulogy and a political introduction, at the political introduction, one person believes it. So I am super, uh, I'm super excited about that. President Davenport, thank you. We were just over there mentioning uh, 17 years. Uh, that's an amazing tenure. That's deep roots in this community. Uh, it speaks volumes for your leadership, and, and I think we know, those of us from across Minnesota know, uh, enrollment is, is an issue at our institutions and trying to make sure we get folks in. And uh, I am proud um, to be an alum. Uh, I am proud to be associated with this, uh, this great institution. And I, uh, I also am going to put another falsehood. Uh, you can come home. Um, that it is true you can come back, that there's deep roots here. Uh, while we're gathered with a lot of folks from across the state, I see a lot of folks that are uh, deeply ingrained in this community. So thank you for that. To the commissioners who are here, I, uh, I get to be with them often, probably more often than they would like to be with me, but uh, part of this is, is uh, surrounding and making sure that, uh, that state government uh, is seen as a partner in everything that we do and making sure that the people that we put in those positions have the, the capabilities, the talent, and the intellect. And I can tell you I could not be prouder than this group you're going to hear from. And I think it may be a, a testament to how seriously we take this issue and, uh, and view our responsibility to address the issues around climate change resiliency and looking towards the future that uh, the agencies that are represented here, from agriculture to transportation to housing um, to uh, MPCA to DNR, across the spectrum are being asked to look through the lens. And yesterday, that was codified with an executive order, 1934, that created the sub-cabinet that when we make decisions from budgeting to policy decisions, they will be through the lens of our previous uh, executive orders, through the lens of equity, inclusion, state and tribal relationships, and the idea of climate and climate sustainability. So thank you to all, all of you. <laughs> the members of the EQB, uh, to our elected officials, uh, Senator Frentz, um, uh, and to our representatives, uh, thank you. Thank you for caring about this. Thank you for the boys. Gene, uh, decades of work. Uh, no one speaks with a clear voice. Uh, no one challenges me to do the right things more than you, and that's exactly what a good representative is supposed to do, so I'm grateful to see you here. Um, I was thinking as I came here, young geography teacher back in the, the 1980s, uh, when the issue of human interactions and, and human uh, activities impacting climate was on the early, uh, and for some of you here, and not so early, but certainly for the mainstream, and certainly for a, uh, a, a secondary education major. It was just starting to come out, and we were still looking at it. The science at that time was not settled, was not a consensus, uh, but it was becoming very clear. And I remember celebrating my first Earth Day in, in 1990 with my sixth grade class when we were combining uh, some math lessons, some geography, some team building, when each of my five classes were given <coughs> sets of instructions to go out on the street next to that middle school um, out there in western Nebraska and follow directions to do a segment on the street. And then at the end of the day, when we all went up on top of the high school and looked down and saw that blue whale there, uh, while not earth changing, while not uh, shaking things up, the sense of awareness and the sense of awe with kids to understand of what was around them and to see what a 100 foot uh, blue whale would look like stretched on a city street in the sand hills of Nebraska, starting to think about how we bring awareness to it. And then thinking towards my last years in the classroom by 2006, um, when the scientific consensus was settled um, that man-made climate change was there and that the education portion for our citizens, just like Thomas Jefferson knew, was going to be critical in any of the democratically decision-making process that was going to happen. Um, I fast forward then uh, in, in changing events for me when I was elected to Congress and one of the first events I held was in the, the winter of 2007, a few short months after taking office, 
I was down in the church in New Ulm with Bishop Chilstrom, the Lutheran bishop. I was there in awe uh, with Will Steger, um, our polar explorer, who I had taught in my classes. I had had the privilege of having Ann Bancroft come down to West High School and present to the school as we were thinking about polar exploration and climate change. And I was also joined there, so you had a newly elected member of Congress, you had Bishop Chilstrom there, you had Will Steger there, and we had the governor of Minnesota, Tim Polenny, there. And the state of Minnesota was leading into some standards on carbon reduction and renewables in our energy grid, setting some ambitious goals that the rest of the country, uh, maybe outside of California, hadn't done yet. And I, I, I think back to that time of the unity around it, and it was just a few short months after that when a very odd commercial started showing up on our TVs, which was a couch sitting in the middle of nowhere with Nancy Pelosi and Newt Gingrich sitting on there and said, we can address climate change. We must address climate change. That was the spring of 2008. Now fast forward uh, to where we're at right now and, and to think about the, uh, the purveyors of the merchant of doubt that have that were able to sow the seeds of dissension to make this become a political litmus test about your, uh, your, uh, your commitment to one political ideology over another and grinding to a halt at a time when the world needs our leadership more than ever, when it becomes apparent that as uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said, this is not an issue that's over the horizon, it is barreling down on us now. Um, and so to see you all gathered here, to know that there are people in this this room that we're dealing with and thinking about this issue from the broad spectrum of solutions long before that young geography teacher back in the 1980s was just starting to get a glimpse of what was happening to the progress that's been made and the frustrations that have led us here till um, to a winter of 2019 when some of the predictions that many of you in this room feared are not just predictions anymore they're daily events and even our uh, local weather forecasters no longer talk about 500-year weather events. They, they talk about them as next summer because that's what ends up happening. Uh, no longer are people able to ignore that we can no longer finance billion-dollar flood programs um, where we've changed the courses of rivers and runoffs um, to the point where we have large swaths of our, uh, our communities uninhabitable. And no longer can we uh, deny the fact that we're going to have to deal with and mitigate changes that are going to impact us from everything to longer pollen seasons, increased asthma, um, changed growing seasons, changed abilities, uh, to massive displacement of people and migrations that have always been a challenge. And right now, knowing that we have more people in flux and in migration and seeking asylum than at any time since post-World War II, uh, the situation requires bold leadership. Uh, I, I'm not here to uh, tell you anything you don't know. I wouldn't hold your breath to expect it to come out of Washington. And I say that of someone who was a proud member of Congress, who believes in that great institution. And Winston Churchill was right. Uh, it's the worst form of government except for every other one. So it is what it is. Um, it's what we have. The difference is the genius of our system allows the states to be those laboratories of democracies and it allows the states to be more nimble. It allows the ability to form new coalitions that have the flexibility and the nimbleness to move quickly where the situation requires it. And that's exactly what we intend to do in Minnesota. It's one of the reasons that yesterday's executive order was meant to operationalize and to make sure that across state government that we have the capacity and the necessity to think about the decisions we make, to think about those decisions, whether it be in the placement of a road. I mean, these are things that uh, uh, Commissioner Anderson Kelleher has to think about now. We're losing roads that are washing out on the North Shore because of the storms on the Great Lakes. We built a water treatment plant in Detroit Lakes that had we not been dealing with climate change, its capacity to handle water and runoff would have been far less. But it is not possible now, nor is it prudent or responsible to not build with the expectation that water treatment plant in Detroit Lakes needs to be handled a thousand year weather event with numbers that are unimaginable right now that will be upon us. So everything from the investments we make in public infrastructure to how we build our roads to how we think about public health are all going to be decisions we make. Overlap that, which I saw a question up here. We know that there's something in here. 
that Minnesota strength comes from the diversity. When you go to climate change conferences, they're pretty white, and that's just exactly the fact it is. One of the things comes with the ability to be off work and to be able to be at a conference. And I don't say that as a pejorative, I say it's just that's the reality of where it's at. The problem that we have is those communities, whether they be indigenous communities or communities of color or socially disadvantaged communities, or by zip code and geography, are going to be the ones that are most impacted and have the least ability to respond to the changes that are coming. They're also going to be left out because those of you who know me, I'm the eternal optimist. I supervised that damn lunch room at West High School for 20 years and it did not get me down. It did not drive me down. I stay up. That I don't make light about this and I will not whistle past the graveyard, but I still believe that innovation and opportunity still lie. We cannot leave those communities behind as we start to transfer and move to that new clean energy economy. Because the myth that has been perpetuated on us since those heady days of 2008 with Nancy and, uh, and Newt being best friends um, is the idea that this will somehow hurt us economically. We had a State Board of Investments meeting yesterday where some young people came and they're talking about divestment from the fossil fuel industry. They're thinking holistically across the board. One of the issues that is, we had commissioned a report that was finally done, Nikita put this out for us, thinking about that $100 billion of, in pensions, many of you in this room have them, that I am, have a fiduciary responsibility to, how are they going to be impacted by this? It's not as simple as the divestment from the fossil fuel industries on this, it's the investments that we have are being eroded. If we are in invested in real estate trusts, those are being taken. All of the things that we're, we're thinking about in the future have to be focused through the lens of that mitigation, sustainability, and the ability for us to protect our citizens. So here in Minnesota, we're taking those bold moves. We proposed, and I want to thank the legislators in this room, that we proposed uh, getting carbon out of our electrical center, out of our power generation system by 2050. And we know that we need to be more aggressive, but we put it in to try and do that. And I'm just gonna tell you the political realities of this, and those in Mankato know me, I'm willing to work together, but I'm not gonna normalize things that shouldn't be normalized. We can hold a damn hearing in the Senate to talk about climate change. We don't need to say no to everything. Hold the hearing. And so putting that out is one thing, but we're also going to use the power that's inherent to us. And I'll, be, I'll tell you this, I come from that first branch of government. I come from the idea that we have separation of powers and are very smart. But if we're going to stall at a time when we can't, we need to use the tools that are available. That's why we're moving Minnesota to a clean car standard. I want to be very clear. This isn't some groundbreaking thing. It's what we all agreed upon, and it's now being rolled back. In the states, the 11 states that have this, not only did it not, uh, not hurt the economy, it grew the economy, it gave consumer choices, it made things possible while at the same time hitting at the point where the most carbon into our system in our transportation system has been done. That's why we're working together with things like the VW settlement and working in uh, Commissioner Anderson Kelleher working with MPCA to talk about the electrification and use those funds to make sure the charging stations are out there. When Ford just announced their new Mustang SUV is going to come out and you notice what they put on there with an extended range above 300 miles. If we have the charging stations in place, they get that. People are gonna start making that decision. You know why? They're gonna save money and it's gonna do the right thing. That's what people want to do. We have been put in a position where roadblocks were put in place. And again, I'll be the first to tell you this. I, markets are wonderful things. And those who say, well, yeah, but government interference with markets, you know what's another bad thing about that is? Monopolies are bad for markets because they create a system where new ideas are not allowed to enter. We're going to make sure in Minnesota that new ideas enter that because we are going to be the first state off the coast of the United States and going to be the 12th state in this nation that is going to enact the clean car standards, reducing our carbon emissions by the largest amount of That's going to happen. But we're not going to do it alone. And for those critics that are out there, you hear it all and you're going to talk about it. And there's some great questions up here. How do we approach our financial markets? How do we approach our education system? And those who say, well, we're not going to be able to do as much about it. No, we're not going to solve the whole problem by ourselves, but we're going to move in the right direction because we have to build that resiliency into it. A few months back, some of you saw this. The New York Times did a story and they had some climatologists and economists and they all came together and they decided that when the, the zombie climate apocalypse is upon us, the best place in the country to live is Duluth, Minnesota. Now, I say this. It might be the best place before the zombie apocalypse, people, so you can think about that. But they were making the point of clean water, 
a transportation system that's in place, a cool climate that will hold back some of those pathogens and allow a growing season that works, starting to think about that of where it will be. We need to start thinking now about building those resiliency in. We need to start thinking now, and it's appropriate, that we're right setting in Mankato and this university and this community that has made green seam and made our agricultural producers see them as part of the solutions for this. We have representatives here from many uh, agricultural industries, soybeans, things like that. Regenerative agriculture and the ability to be able to sequester is a promise that's out there. I make no apologies about this, but I know it is somewhat of my Achilles heel. Uh, I am that eternal optimist, and I also, I tell people, my favorite movie is The Martian. We can science our way out of this if we try hard enough. I'm not naive, but there is that possibility. The only way we're going to do that is, is the state of Minnesota investing in research in our institutions, investing in those partners that have the capacity to try and adjust this, both in terms of mitigation and in terms of starting to pull back on that number. We're at a point right now, we can't wait. We can't wait for D.C. to decide that they're going to function again as a democracy should function. But we here in the state of Minnesota have built coalitions across not just government, not just across uh, political divides. We built them with the business community, they built them with nonprofits, and again, the piece that was in there, and I'm not going to be afraid to say it, there was a piece in there that I was really hopeful for back in that meeting in 2007 on that snowy day in the Lutheran Church in New Ulm. The sense of stewardship over creation, whichever uh, school of thought you come from on that, that this is our responsibility to make sure that our children inherit this. When you listen to these young people, it is absolutely unconscionable and immoral that we feel like we've stolen their childhood from them and they feel like they can't look to the future. And that part of it is something that we need to give them hope that we're tackling this. And that doesn't mean a reckless abandon. It doesn't mean, as my wife always says this, we, uh, she says hope is the most powerful word in the universe. We named our firstborn child hope, but she said it's not a damn plan. So you need to have a plan how you're going to get to where you're going to go. It is fine, and somebody needs to have the aspirational goal of where we're going, but we need a room full of people like this. We need a state of people like Minnesotans who are used to putting their nose to the grindstone and solving the toughest problems. We need to be able to strongly have conversations and disagree. But I will tell you right now, the time of sticking your head in the sand, of ignoring that this didn't happen, and I will not debate the scientific consensus around this because it is stupid, irresponsible, and setting us backward. I will debate what are the best ways to get there. I will acknowledge that we may not have the idea that gets there best and someone else may not. I fully acknowledge that there are incredible triggers in a free market economy that can unleash this if we actually have a level playing field. And the one thing that I will demand is we need to be able to agree that facts are facts sometimes and you're not entitled to your own. If you have an opinion, then express it. Good for you. But you're not going to get into a space where we're making decisions that are going to impact future generations based on your opinion to be able to say that. We're going to base it on a scientific consensus. We're going to base it on those principles that we know can get there. And the state of Minnesota and these folks you're going to hear from up here have been charged to find what those answers are. So I, for one, tell you this. This is our time. This is our time. That idea of that Chinese uh, curse and proverb may be live in interesting times. Whether you like it or not, you are. Whether you like it or not, this generation is going to be judged how we address this. And I have, to, uh, I have to tell you, too, if it does come down to that argument, I go back to Pascal's wager. I'll tell you this. It's better off for us to assume that this thing is really happening and we address it accordingly than to ignore it and pretend that maybe it will go away. Because here's the deal. If we're wrong on this, we create our own energy, we create a fair, more equitable society, and we do so with everybody involved in it. If they're wrong, we destroy the planet, and future generations will have to live with the destruction that comes from that. So I tell all of you, there is a, uh, there's a seriousness to this. There's a sense of urgency to it. It's not about spreading fear. It's about being reasonable and rational about what we're facing. It's about using science and reason. It's about using basic human compassion and a sense of uh, servant leadership and uh, stewardship of this planet. And it's about making a democratically elected system service in a way that addresses things people know we need to. So the upside of this is Minnesota is prepared to lead. Minnesota is well positioned because of our geographic location and because of the blessings of our natural resources to weather this thing as well as we possibly can. But it also gives us, I think, an added responsibility 
that we can show the rest of the country how this should go. We need to reassume where we were in 2007 as a national leader. We need to start leaning forward into these things, and we need to make sure that every single Minnesotan is a part of that discussion. So uh, I congratulate you on being here. I thank you for the expertise that you put into this. Um, I ask you to uh, challenge us as an administration, challenge these folks as they think about ways to bring real solutions, and. Uh, and keep the optimism, whatever your optimism is, I'm telling you, you see that lunchroom for 20 years, you're just hoping for the next day. And um, I, for one, stay incredibly optimistic. Minnesotans are people who have been at this before. You've heard me say it a million times, but I continue to say it. We're the folks that our agriculture producers started the Green Revolution and Norman Borlaug and we fed the world. It was our iron that built the country it was our medical breakthroughs that everything from open heart surgeries to pacemakers. And then on the weekends, we invented water skiing because that's just who we are. So um, climate change is upon us. The ability to address it and the solutions are out there. The ability to use a democratically elected system to change things and be more nimble is our challenge. And I believe these folks, and I believe you, and I can tell you our administration, we're up to the challenge. So thank you. Thank you, Governor. That was really um, inspiring. And of course, we know that we have a task ahead of us and that we willingly jumped into this. So um, since he answered all the questions up there, no, I can't. <laughs> what are we going to do? No, we are here to answer a lot of your questions. So I'm going to take this mic over to the noticed when I'm sitting over here that it's very hard to see this part of the panel. Maybe we can move the podium back a little bit. Again, thank you all for coming. I'm Laura Bishop, for those of you who weren't here in the morning, and I am the chair of the EQB, but also the commissioner of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And I'm also now the chair of the new sub-cabinet on climate change, so I'm really excited about that. We are very fortunate today to have a number of our commissioners here that are either on the EQB uh, or on the climate sub-cabinet or on both, like me. So I'm uh, very pleased to have all of you here. I will start and I ask each commissioner to introduce themselves and say uh, themselves and their agency and just say, uh, few words about how their agency interacts uh, with climate change. And um, I will say from my standpoint, certainly beyond the responsibilities and hats that I'm wearing to chair these subcommittees, uh, the MPCAA has a huge role in climate change. The mission of, their, of our agency is to protect and improve the environment and human health. So at the root of that, uh, we see climate change as uh, impacting really everything we do and figuring out ways to both mitigate and create climate resiliency. We also, under the clean cars, uh, as we saw, we have the power to and authority to regulate uh, carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a big role that our agency plays in climate. I will pass it on to the next commissioner. Thanks, Thanks. Commissioner. My name is Jennifer Ho, and I'm the head of Minnesota Housing. Uh, we're basically the state's housing bank. Uh, we invest in the rehabilitation, preservation, and production of both single-family homes and apartments. Uh, uh, our homes uh, consume a fifth of all the energy that's used in the state, and so it's really important that we are doing things to rehab old homes to be more energy efficient and to make sure that we're building new homes that are up to uh, high green standards. That's our goal. 
I'm Margaret Anderson Kelleher. I am delighted to be here with you. I'm the Commissioner of Transportation. I'm also a native of Mankato. I feel like uh, the governor was talking about me in that lunchroom, but we didn't quite overlap. So um, I'm, I'm really glad to be in this role right now, to be asked by the governor to do this work. In uh, 2007, working with Gene Wiginius and others, we were able, and Gene's leadership, able to pass the renewable energy standard and start to work on this path to carbon reduction. I am happy to pick up the work that's been happening at the Department of Transportation and move that forward with the pathways to decarbonization work with elevating our now Assistant Commissioner for Sustainability and Public Health, Tim Sexton, into the role to make sure that at every level of the Department of Transportation, we are both working on the pathway to decarbonization, working together, I'm a member of the EQB and the sub-cabinet, to make sure that transportation, now the largest emitter of greenhouse gases in our state, is working and it has to be with all of us to reduce that and really bend that curve downward and hopefully to zero. I'm Steve Kelly. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Commerce. So many of you are probably familiar with the work that we do related to energy, our interaction with climate change. Uh, the department is an advocate for the public interest before the Public Utilities Commission on issues uh, that are regulated utilities uh, bring before the commission and uh, has played a role on the decarbonization of the electric sector up to now. We also act as the conduit for federal funding for weatherization and for uh, low-income energy assistance. So we also play a role on the equity side um, by enabling low-income homeowners to afford to pay their bills, but also, um, to, more importantly, um, change their homes to be more energy efficient, more comfortable, better places to live, uh, and uh, we can probably uh, do more of that if we had the resources. We also work directly with the utilities on conservation improvement. So Minnesota's had a leading uh, program to reduce energy use um, through uh, requiring our utilities to reduce energy use by one and a half percent a year uh, and has been uh, successful in doing that. Now, lots of people don't know that the Commerce Department also regulates state chartered banks uh, credit unions, we regulate all the insurance companies in the state, and we regulate broker dealers and securities professionals. And the governor mentioned this in connection with the uh, um, State Investment Board. Um, we're starting to work with our regulated entities because on the adaptation side, uh, we're concerned about the potential risks uh, facing banks and insurance companies uh, from a failure to adapt to climate change. We also are paying attention to the risks to um, homeowners uh, from uh, increased rates for insurance as some of the increases in events and severity of events um, that Dr. Brownman described this morning um, could occur. Uh, and so those are the areas that we're trying to, we're trying to uh, create a, a bridge across these two different uh, activities of the department uh, in the same way that working with the other um, agencies uh, through the EQB and through the new sub-cabinet, we see this as an opportunity to work um, together and work collaboratively to address the challenges of climate change. Thank you, Commissioner. Good afternoon, I'm Sarah Stroman and I have the pleasure of serving as the Commissioner of the Department of Natural Resources. And I really believe there is very little, if any, of our work that is not intertwined with climate change issues, whether that is reducing our own carbon footprint as a large agency, or whether that is managing habitats with resiliency in mind, or whether that is preaching ice safety, as we are right now, uh, but to ice anglers who, uh, as they're out of Minnesota lakes, some of those lakes which are experiencing ice out up to a week earlier, uh, than uh, in decades previous. 
uh, or whether it's uh, collecting and disseminating data and information through the State Office of Climatology, which is housed at the DNR. Those are just a few examples. I don't have time to go into all of our work, but um, there's a lot uh, going on, and I'm really pleased to be here and really pleased to be able to um, work both as part of the EQB and as the Climate Subcabinet with my colleagues here. Thank you. Again, uh, hi, I'm uh, Tom Peterson. I uh, serve as the Commissioner of Agriculture, and um, you know, I, I'd agree with Sarah. Like, I, I really look at our agency, and I think our leadership and our agency looks at that in agriculture, just about everything we do impacts our uh, climate, you know, and, and I've been a believer in that a long time, and I was excited when the governor was running for governor that he talked about climate a lot. Um, and I've worked with many of you in this room for years on whether it's renewable energy or land use practices or alternative crops, and now to be commissioner and try to implement a lot of those. Uh, it can be challenging at times, but it's um, right now, this year, I always say every day that there's challenges and opportunities. And this, for the weather-wise, has been the most challenging year. Wettest year on record for our farmers, our poorest farm income in 23 years. You know, we didn't get a million acres planted this year. Uh, it just goes on and on, you know, worst sugar beet harvest ever. Uh, you know, and we see a lot of um, challenges in that. And so I think as we look at it as an agency, as we try to say, how can we support our farmers and agriculture, um, but also look at the opportunities, whether it is in renewable energy and biofuels. I was really excited to see the governor, um, you know, as part of our climate initiatives to look at how we can reduce greenhouse gases through uh, uh, biofuels. We have the um, biofuels task force. We had almost 70 applicants for that, which was phenomenal. Um, I think in, in planting, uh, not planting crops this year, farmers had to plant cover crops. And so for a lot of farmers, a lot of times that's the first time they're planting a cover crop or using a cover crop or doing, and so it, lean, it learns and it uh, brings on uh, discussions. And so in that, we see uh, tremendous uh, opportunities as well for our farmers. And I think that's where I want to look and really focus uh, as a commissioner. Thank you. I'm John Jasky. I'm the executive director of the Board of Water and Soil Resources, and a little bit different than the others here. We have a board that's appointed by the governor, and so we operate that way, and of course also are part of the EQB board. Uh, we work with these other agencies and many other partners. Our agency works really to local uh, decision making and local project management, and of course as the governor talked about, water and soil are both very much tied to climate, both in terms of trying to deal with the water challenges that we see when we get uh, rainfall and flooding events that have exceeded the things that we've planned for or designed for. And of course, the soil is also, as the commissioner just described, you know, an opportunity for us to, to improve the climate by using that soil as a resource that's been, in some cases, or many cases, underutilized. That's really important for our farmers, but also in other parts of our state. We can also take a look at using that as a mechanism to do some mitigation. So I look forward to serving with Commissioner Bishop on the sub cabinet and making some of these things turn into action. Great, thank you so much. So I know that we have a limited time left for questions, but we wanna to get to a number of these questions. And I think even in your remarks, you did um, address some of them, especially the fourth one down, but I think the top one, and it's really risen to the top, um, is how we diversify this room. And I would like to, I think, start with uh, Commissioner Stroman uh, on this because you've done a lot on getting kids outdoors but also thinking about that in bringing in um, workers into DNR as well and just wanted to get your perspective on that and then have others chime in too. All right, thank you. Well, um, maybe I'll start, and, and you know, I appreciate the governor's words um, for those of us who have been coming to these meetings for many years. Um, you know, the room has not changed significantly. It has changed some, we should acknowledge that. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things um, that I, I note and one of the things that we're committed to at, at DNR is moving past that discussion of talking about how we diversify and really moving into the action and getting out, reaching out to uh, diverse communities, communities of color, um, folks who are not uh, in our circles today 
and, and making sure they are welcome and included. And in that, um, we will take some risks. Not every effort we make will be successful, but if we don't just get out and start trying some things, uh, we won't move past the discussion stage. So um, we are doing some new um, work to recruit uh, diverse candidates within the agencies, and actually we have a partnership with MPCA and Bowser um, to reach uh, back to young kids and mentor them. Uh, into careers, uh, it's a it's a multi-year, multi-step um, process, internship uh, opportunity, uh, and then we're working uh, really hard to think about how we make our uh, public spaces and services that we offer, such as our state parks, our wildlife areas, uh, open and welcoming and culturally relevant uh, to folks who traditionally have not uh, found those spaces welcoming uh, and who have traditionally not used them. And then I think the other thing, maybe I'll just mention and then I'll pass it on, is, is being willing to have conversations in different ways and in different venues. That we cannot just expect people uh, to come into our spaces and, and our conversations and have them with the same topics and same ways that we have had them for you know ever. We need to be willing to change, and sometimes that's hard uh, for state agencies because we get pretty rooted in our processes, but we just, again, have to be willing to take those risks and have conversations uh, where people are at, and that means physically where they are at and where they are at um, in culturally relevant ways as well. I'd like to add, and I do think it's on all of us to continue to diversify the movement of environment, sustainability, and climate, and to be working forward on diversity and inclusion all the time. I am heartened to see so many tribal leaders who presented here today and been here today with us because this is an administration that takes very seriously our role as government to government. And I think that is a reflection of how that respect goes and what we need to be doing. At the Department of Transportation, one of the things that's critical is acknowledging when we have not done well. And so our Rethinking I-94 project is one that I'd like to hold up for you as something that is ongoing and moving forward. And that is the acknowledgement by the previous commissioner and administration and ongoing that we did wrong in communities along I-94 and even 35W by destroying communities of color through the urbanization of highways. And what we are doing going into the next phase of what happens is having communities at the table leading the discussion with us. And we need to do that actually across the state. It's one of the things that we're working on. I know Greg Aus is here as our district engineer uh, for this area, is working with all of our district engineers and their leadership teams to make sure where historic trauma has been really perpetrated by the Department of Transportation, we are doing much better in having the conversation, making amends, and being able to plan forward through environmental justice and through the effects of making sure we're not making it worse in the next way that we do things. And so that is one of the things I think, you know, not not ever, and I thought the governor was articulate about this, we, we know that we have barriers that we put up to participation. We need to rip those barriers down and meet people where they are and also acknowledge what has not gone well in government in the past. Thank you. And I, I just want to add some work that we're doing at the Department of Agriculture is that we are uh, um, really working on what we call our emerging farmers because we look at the average age of a farmer in Minnesota is 58 years old. New Sense is going to be almost 60, and you know almost half of the land uh, in Minnesota is going to change hands in the next 20 years just because of the demographics. You look at a county like 57 percent of the land in Minnesota is not farmed by the owner of that land. In Blue Earth County, where we are here, it's almost 70%. And so we're always interested in how do we get more farmers and how do we get like a diverse group of farmers. And so we're having uh, emerging farmer leader meetings around the state right now and, and inviting people. And so we have one tomorrow in St. Cloud. And I'm really excited when I look at the diversity that we have, whether it's Somali and Hmong, Latino, our, our tribal uh, uh, participation has been wonderful in those meetings, but we see a lot of the themes that come out of that, whether it's like access to land and what kind of farming they want to be doing or going towards 
that really helps guide us as an agency. And then also as we look as an agency, we, um, we do a lot of grants at the Department of Agriculture that help uh, the different groups and you know um, having the same the different reviewers or people that are involved in that and then also serving on committees within the Department of Agriculture that we have people that are different and so I think having those meetings is around is very helpful so we have one more next uh, tomorrow in St. Cloud and then one uh, a week from now in uh, Rochester the lieutenant governor's attending and so I think it's just really helpful for me and it, it and it's again very positive it's exciting to see people that want to get in uh, to agriculture and farming yeah I think what we're hearing is how do we get to the root of getting people engaged and want to be engaged and well we saw that the percentages of people here were government or uh, NGOs, so how do we ensure that we're integrating and getting more uh, diversity into those fields as well? And uh, I think that's a good point. I think the other piece that has come up and that we looked at uh, with the questions and see kind of at the bottom there is about uh, environmental justice. So having those voices that are most impacted right now be part of the plans and decision making and how we engage them in kind of that climate planning, climate decision making. Does anyone want to take that right now? Hello? Anyone? Oh, yeah, I'd be happy to jump in on that. Commissioner Ho. First of all, I just want the folks in the room who don't know to just know that the governor and lieutenant governor challenge us every day uh, to be thinking about equity uh, and communities most impacted in all of the work that we do. And just sitting up here, I don't get a chance to be with y'all very often, but just being able to sit, sit with y'all and hear what you're doing, it's very inspiring to me. And, and um, you know, some of the same things we're trying to do at Minnesota Housing. I mean, I think we all know that it's um, it's 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 poor communities that are most impacted by these issues and communities of color, indigenous communities that are most impacted uh, by this. And so how we uh, get out in front, and thinking a little bit about the the work that's happening along the Mississippi River in North Minneapolis, to kind of take what has been a kind of industrial, heavy industrial space and turn it into community. And you know how those conversations go with community right now. Are, are the things that we don't want to look back on in 20 years and, and say the wrong people were at the, at the wrong tables. And so making sure that we uh, go into communities and sit with people early on in the planning stages is so important. Sit with the people who are the most impacted. Steve, Commissioner Kelly. Thank you, Commissioner Ho. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. So I'm going to Actually, there are a couple questions up there that kind of work together. So um, low-income uh, folks um, generally, one of the, um, Brianna from the Minnesota Valley CAP Agency mentioned during her presentation the challenge of enabling a low-income person living in a mobile home to participate in owning a piece of a community solar garden. Um, one of the things that we can do a better job on is working with um, organizations um, like the CAP agencies, like um, Cooperative Energy Futures in the Twin Cities, or uh, the Rural, Rural Renewable Energy Alliance, to identify more ways uh, to enable low-income people um, to participate uh, in generating electricity. Um, at the same time, um, they may have um, homes that are heated with propane, and we can identify ways that um, electrifying um, their heating system um, could be beneficial, but if they're in a leaky house, uh, we're not really gaining anything with that switch. So I, I do think we need to look at the system as a whole, and at the same time we're talking about beneficial electrification, we also have to be uh, more aggressive about um, our approach to weatherization, uh, to retrofitting existing homes, especially for um, low-income people, um, in order to relieve the energy burden uh, uh, that they are facing. Uh, that challenge exists in large measure also in um, tribal communities, and so we have to pay attention to how we connect with them. And so later this month, 
uh, our energy assistance and weatherization assistance teams are meeting with a group of um, tribal um, staff members to make sure that we understand um, the needs that uh, those communities are facing, as well as to understand the opportunities exist to do a better um, job. Um, the tribes have also, uh, a few of the leaders have identified being uh, energy self-sufficient as a, as a potential goal for their communities. And uh, the Prairie Island Indian community, which has been uh, incurring the burden of the, one of our uh, nuclear energy plants in Minnesota on their <coughs> island, um, is interested in becoming a zero net energy reservation. I think those are the kinds of initiatives um, that we can support. And one of the, you know, as we fill vacancies at the Department of Commerce, uh, keep your eyes open for the position announcement. Um, we'd like to have somebody work directly with um, tribes and other communities on getting uh, new uh, renewable energy projects built, um, making sure that people have access to the technical expertise in order to get things done locally. Thank you, and that's a great. I'm going to the next question um, on how can the state effectively partner with Minnesota tribes, sovereign nations uh, to address climate change. And certainly uh, you've given one example there, but we have a lot of other examples as well as this commitment that we do have to our tribal governments in recognizing, and I know Commissioner Kelleher had said this, but recognizing that government to government relationship and we are doing tribal consultations all around the state, every one of our agencies, and really trying to form those relationships and understand issues that we can work on together and tackle together in climate change and this climate change subcabinet, I think is a great way for us to uh, be able to build on ideas as well as action plans together. But go ahead. So I think this, um, one of the pieces that we engage in as commissioners and with our tribal liaison staff is regular engagement of the sovereign tribal nations, including consultation, where going out and meeting with the leaders, the elected leadership of the tribes, to be able to hear. And so what I would say about this question is partly how much we learn and how much we change the methodology of what we are doing at MnDOT because something is brought to our attention. So it might be the type of culverting system that is used in northeastern or northwestern, in the edge of northwestern Minnesota, that is affecting the ability to bring back native wild rice to an area where historically that food and medicine has been important to the tribal nation and maybe that system is not working so well right now. So figuring out together, often bringing the counties into it too. So I don't wanna miss that the state of Minnesota has a lot to do here, but frankly, when you talk about roads and bridges, townships and counties have even more road miles that impact people. And so sometimes it's MnDOT uh, helping facilitate a conversation between people as well to be able to solve the problem. Another thing that's come to our attention and one of the things that we're starting to, we're working on two things particularly and then I'll pass it the mic to someone else here, is the roads, the use of uh, the roadside for both, not only the pollinator, but medicine growth. And what I mean native medicine growth, the plants, the historical plants, that are important to tribes. That has not been typically a way that MnDOT has looked at that roadside, and so being able to do that. And then I would say the third thing is we are also moving forward with our examination broadly about right away and how we can utilize right away not only to preserve pollinator habitat, and we are working on this as a, we have a team effort here on this issue, but the next piece is energy production. And so looking at could we use uh, MnDOT right away in places for solar production? And would that be something, and that's gonna take a lot of steps to get through, but we are beginning that conversation and having that conversation. That's great. Commissioner Sturman. So I wanted to just pull out um, one thing that um, the Commissioner was just saying about the, the medicinal plants, and I think the, the role of traditional ecological knowledge 
um, along with the science and data that our agencies produce is, is part of this um, the solution here. And, and I'm gonna uh, call out my friends from Mille Lacs here because uh, we've been having this conversation about how we uh, bring those those two ways of thinking together. And you know, I look, um, Mille Lacs Dean, our Commissioner Bradley Harrington is here and you could just wave, but um, he, he and I uh, share the challenge of managing walleye in Mille Lacs Lake and you know, one of the, the things that's affecting the lake clearly is climate change. And um, you know, as I think about that challenge and think about the opportunity, one of those opportunities I think that helps us um, address this question of working with tribal governments, we have very strict um, treaties and court order protocols that tell us what we have to do to work together to manage the lake. But I think the conversation that we're having is about what can we do to better work together and what can we do to bring the cultural values um, that the tribe has around the lake and walleye alongside you know, the science and data that we're producing on population to, to manage that more effectively uh, together for the benefit of everybody. So um, Commissioner, thank you because you have challenged my thinking on this and I um, have full faith that we're gonna get to a better place on this. Thank you. So we only have five minutes left for a panel. So I'd like to go to two, I'd like to end with that second question of what the administration's goals, but before I get there, I'd like to um, hit on agriculture because there were a lot of them and there were several questions if we added up all the thumbs I think would get at this. But um, we'll have both Ag and Bowser maybe comment on this one in, you know, how can um, our agriculture community really be part of the solution on uh, climate change and really bringing them to the table and how can they be part of the solution? Yeah, and I kind of said some of it before, but I think that a few things have really struck me in driving around the state, and I've literally been in every corner of the state uh, this year. As, and you know, I, I'd say like, um, really by the hype on soil health, uh, you know, I think it's really interesting to me because I can go to a lot of different farms and they'll all show me practices that they've changed, you know, that they really have figured it out. And I think it's interesting, everybody may or may not know in this room, corn went really high. So uh, a few years ago, corn went to seven, almost eight dollars sometimes, and then it went really low. And at the same time, fertilizer, seed price, equipment, land rent, everything went high and stayed there. So what happened is the farmer's cost of production is way down here. And to survive, farmers had to start looking for something else to do. So they started looking and say, I can't make these big tractor payments. I can't pay these fertilizer costs. And then they started learning that from other farmers. And I think that's one of the ways sometimes too, we're always, you know, say, what, what do we need to do? you know, uh, as state government, but a lot of times it's it's supporting what the farmers are doing and learning from each other. And so I've been really uh, excited to see um, all the different things that are going on there. So for example, at the Department of Agriculture, we have an Ag BMP loan, where we've loaned out um, almost 4,000 loans for almost $100 million with no-till equipment. And you see the, um, uh, really taking off everywhere. And I heard, I don't know if some of you were in the egg part, but you're the one farmer say, you know, five years ago, I was the crazy farmer. Now I'm the one, everybody, I'm having a field day and there's a hundred people showing up at my farm to figure out why I'm growing cover crops and I have feed in the spring. You know, so I think that that's kind of my goal too is to, you know, um, as, as commissioner is to support those ideas. And so uh, a lot of our soil health initiatives and biofuels too is a really important piece. I really encourage you a lot of times, I think as an egg community, we haven't done the best job messaging. A lot of people think of ethanol as ethanol 20 years ago. It's different, the corn production's different, the plant production, the water cycle, the energy cycle, everything's changing very rapidly. In Minnesota, our plants are leaders in this. And, um, you know, so again, supporting uh, a lot of those things are going on. Finally, I just say um, alternative crops, too, are a really big thing. A lot of you are familiar with Forever Green. We've mentioned Kernza. Um, you know, I'd say uh, a couple hours north of here, too, there's a big conference going on right now in St. Cloud, a hemp conference, where a couple, hemp conference, where a couple of the farmers are on a panel left and went to that. And hemp isn't, you know, uh, quite, you know, uh, 
it, it uses less water and energy, but I want to make my point is that I've always said if, a, if we have an alternative crop, farmers will grow it. So we went from seven farms four years ago, uh, to or 40 farms last year, to 400 farms this year. We went from 700 acres to almost 8,000 acres uh, overnight, you know, and so Farmers, if they have that opportunity, they have that market, and there's a lot of uh, things uh, coming uh, through those initiatives, and those are other things that we want to support and help grow. So that's just a quick snapshot, but John can maybe Thank add you. a few things. John, you just real briefly, uh, you know, the commissioner described pretty well. I think it's not, I, I do agree that soil health is the scale up opportunity that we're going to need to, you know, undertake, not only for climate benefits, but for water quality and, and and production benefits too, you know, growing that soil and having it be a healthy, you know, resource is adding value to a farm which primarily has as a primary asset land, right? So that's a really important, you know, long term endeavor. But you know, there's hope and opportunity both. And one of the ways that we're gonna try and take advantage of both of those things is the Minnesota Office for Soil Health, the university. You heard President Devonport talk about the importance of you know applied research and we're using that at the University of Minnesota to try and bring information to farmers. They're very, very maybe the most practical people in the world and they want to know how something's gonna work and if it's gonna work before they actually take it on and do it themselves. And learning from their peers is really important. Learning from those who can prove it's going to work to help those first uh, initiators to be successful is also very important. So I believe, as the commissioner said, that is one of our most uh, important endeavors in the decades ahead. Great. And before I thank all the commissioners, I'll address this second one, which is what are your administration's goals for the upcoming 2020 decade to combat global warming and certainly as the newly crowned chair of the sub cabinet on climate this is exactly the work that is underway and that we will be doing is establishing these goals you've we have a um, goal already in place for the state which is 80 percent uh, carbon reduction by uh, 2050 and we're already seeing that that isn't uh, Boulder fast enough. So by 2030, um, we expect to be, uh, or by 2025, the goal is also 30% reduction. Currently, um, in 2016, we were, based on 2016 data, we've only had a 12% reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions. So our main collective goal is to meet or exceed the greenhouse gas goals that are already set in standard or in in law by our uh, great representatives that are here and Representative Wikinius who led the way, but it's to uh, exceed those goals. And so that's what we'll be working on with our clean car standards, our 100% clean energy, as well as other initiatives that we'll be putting forward with that goal in mind. So with that, I'd like to just say thank you to all the commissioners for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you.